Hi there. This is uh, uh, Saturday, March 10th, 2018. This is Phil Simborg from the Backgammon Learning Center. And I'm here with uh, a fellow teacher uh, and one of the top players in the world, uh, Steve Sack. Say hello, Steve. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So the reason we're here today is uh, I've had a lot of people that love our little quizzes, and, and uh, this is a way to show you just uh, the kind of uh, information that's available if you really use uh, Extreme Gammon and a teacher in combination to learn the right checker and cube plays for backgammon. Yesterday we had our usual Chicago Chouette. We play three or four times a week. I do not name names because I don't want to embarrass people, including myself, who miss positions, but I take a lot of pictures uh, of positions where we either uh, not sure what to do and we often bet on them. And the one, the eight positions I'm about to show you, at least somebody in the Chouette got wrong or we had a bet on it. And I think they're interesting. I, I throw out the ones that are pretty, I think, pretty obvious or not that interesting. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to see how good Steve Sachs would do if he was in our Chouette. He has not seen these positions. He is going to, uh, as, uh, live uh, on this program, uh, determine what he would do. And then we'll see what the right answer is. And then Steve and I can maybe discuss why it's the right answer. Now, because this is a video, you can test yourself, too. When I show the position, you can pause it and take as long as you want to see what answer you would come up with. I think these are very educational and fun to do. Before we start, I would, uh, because last Monday, uh, with the passing of the great Paul McGrill, who is one of our teachers and a good friend of both mine and Steve for many years, I would like to take a moment of silence, which is what we are asking uh, backgammon clubs and tournaments uh, around the world to do uh, for a while. Uh, in honor of the the very very great uh, superstar writer author teacher and friend Paul McGrill, so we're going to give him a moment of silence right now in his memory. Okay, and uh, Paul has attended uh, some of our boot camps. Mochi and I were giving boot camps. He's attended those. Was greeted like a rock star, and he was really a master at explaining positions and showing variations and, and getting into the nitty-gritty. And uh, Steve and I have both learned a lot from him from his books and from working with him personally and seeing his lectures. But I think Steve is one of the best in the world as well, and that's why he's here. So let's get right to work. Uh, the first position, in no particular order, these are just the order that I think they came up while we were playing. Uh, the first position is, these are all money games. This is a cube action problem, actually a recube. Red is holding a two cube and thinking about whether to redouble. So the question is, should red redouble? And if he does, should blue take or pass? So, Bob, Steve, what is your approach to this? Here. Okay, so um, red's off in four or five rolls. Uh, if he rolls a double, you know, double ace, double deuce, double five, double six, it's going to assist him in being able to be off in three or four rolls, possibly. Blue's got a little bit of work to do themselves. They may not uh, be successful in bearing off in four rolls. So even if red misses here, I mean, assuming that it, this would be a redouble, we haven't, I haven't determined that yet. But assuming that red even misses here, blue, it's going to be a little while before they can, you know, turn the cube back because there were a couple aces or a couple deuces. They're off in five rolls. Um these are some of the weaker uh, positions as far as concept is concerned for me, but I'll try and do my best here. Uh, so from what I um, understand about short races, uh, you have the total pip count, and then you add two penalty pips for each checker beyond one on the ace point. You add one penalty pip for each checker beyond one on the deuce point, you had one penalty pip for each gap. So red, even though they're starting off with 23 pips, uh, they actually have one, two, three, four, five, seven penalty pips. So now we're up to 30 pips. Uh, what does it say here? Um, effective pip count 36. So this is using a, a different method than I than I use. Uh, in any case, and and blue's position is. Uh, Pretty pure. I mean, he does have a gap on the ace and deuce, so he's got the 28 pips plus the penalty pip for each gap. That's 30, but it's also 36. So this is maybe I'm using the wrong methodology. But in any case, uh, 
it's kind of cheating to look at the effective hip count because it's really giving you a clue. So let me pretend that I can't see that um, and just try and determine the position based on roles. Uh, yeah, John O'Hagan was helping me a little bit with uh, Stack and Straggler, but this is not exactly that, that case. So um, let's see. So I came up with, let's see, 30 hips to 20, 28, 30, 30 to 30. So, well, we're certainly the favorite there. Uh, would we want to redouble? Let's get, let me get, let me think about this a second here. So I'm off in one, two, three, four, maybe five. He's off in one, two, three, four, or five. It doesn't seem like it's a redouble actually. Um, and I apologize if I'm using the effective, effective pip count to assist myself. I'm trying not to. But just using my PIP methodology, it seems like it's not quite a redouble. So uh, maybe Phil could fill us in more on what's really going on here. So you say no redouble and take? Uh, yeah, it would definitely take. And uh, I think it's not a redouble, but I'm not, I really don't know. These, these are my weaker p types of positions. I think these are everybody's weaker types of positions. However, you got it right. I'm going to hit the button. And uh, you'll see that it would be a blunder. Anything more than 0.08 is a blunder by terminology. Although, in, in my opinion, it's not that terrible a blunder to make a 9% cube error in complicated positions. And in this one, it wouldn't be that horrible to make a, a mistake in double because I promise you, you'll get some passes uh, in spite of the fact that it's a, a 0.45 error to pass. What I'm more interested in is in the, in the methodology, uh, EPC, the way I learned it, and again, you mentioned John O'Hagan. He's my teacher on these kind of cubes as well, and certainly uh, has shared his knowledge with all of our 24 teachers of the Back M and Learning Center that we use. And he's pretty much taught us to use EPC when we have a, a more of a, a flat versus, uh, uh, versus rolls position. In these kinds of positions, he doesn't think EPC is necessarily that effective either. So even if you didn't use EPC, what you were doing by adding penalty points for open points, there's a lot of controversy of how to do that because with the choice and with uh, the uh, Keith count, you don't add a penalty point for an open three point. And I noticed that you didn't add a penalty to, to blue for the open six point, which is a penalty according to Keith and Trice. So I'm not sure, and most of us agree that Keith and Trice break down when you get down to here. So I think your best approach, which really worked, is counting the the number of rolls likely to happen. And you also mentioned something I think is a great uh, concept and very, very important. How likely is Blue able to get in a recube very quickly? And uh, uh, you saw that he uh, that, that could happen as well, and that might be a reason for not doubling because you sure wouldn't want Blue to be holding a four cube here with 35% and, uh, uh, and all kinds of ways that Red could miss a couple times. So uh, I think we all, I, I don't think anybody's got this kind of position down to a science. Yeah, well, they're, they're difficult for me, so uh, I hope we can get into some middle game positions coming up in the next few problems. <laughs> well, I started you with the toughest one. Uh, over the board, this was doubled and taken, and it was a wrong double, but again, I don't fault the doubler that much because he almost got a pass, and, uh, and, and, and it, wasn't, it isn't terrible to double when you're a 65% favorite. But it was wrong, clearly wrong. Now, the, what really gets tough and what I really love to do with John O'Hagan is change the score <laughs> and see what you do in different match scores. There you can go nuts on these positions. Sometimes this is going to be a massive double in an automatic recube, and sometimes it's going to be a pass, depending on scores. So this could really be uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, to do in match scores. Let's go to the next one. Okay. But congratulations, you're one for one. All right. All right, here we have a uh, another cube situation. And we seem to take more pictures of cubes because that's where the big money swings are in match play. But in this case, blue is on roll, cube is in the center. The question again is, does blue have a double and does red have a take or pass? You can pause it if you don't want to hear Steve's answer first and come up with your own. But let's see what Steve would do and how he would approach this and what his answer is. Well, if I had... Five seconds to answer, I would say it's not a double. But let's try and take a little bit more than five seconds. 
and just sort of uh, trying to determine what's going on here. So Kahlua has uh, a pretty good position. They have three uh, builders to actually make the 10-point or the 9-point. If they make the 10-point, they're actually sending a fifth checker behind a prime and making a broken 5-point blockade. And if they make the 9-point, uh, I guess if they rolled a 6-5, they could make the 9-point. That's pretty strong. So you're containing, uh, I'm almost talking myself into doubling this now. I, I'm thinking about it. Let me ask you a question before you go on. If you rolled a 6-4, would you make the 9-point or would you hit? Uh, I would make the 9-point. Okay. Because if you hit, then you got to ask yourself, where's my 6? Uh -huh. And you are outboarded. So being outboarded, uh, you know, and hitting, and then, you know, if you're going to play big and play 15-9, now why not just make the point in the first place? So if you were going to play, if you were going to hit with the four and play safe, then he's got a, you know, double indirect to hit you back and he has you outboarded. So, and with two blocks in jeopardy, you know, red can turn the game around. So, the way, might be because this is on YouTube, uh, not everybody is necessarily a higher level player. Outboarded, what Steve means is that red has three inner board points and blue has two, which means that red is actually a favorite in a hitting exchange because he has more ways to come in than, than blue does. So that's what outboarded means. I just want to make sure by definition. Go ahead. I think this is a really, really, I mean, I hate to say it's close when I don't know that it's close, but it feels close in that if I, if I, uh, if, because red has two pieces out of play, sort of. I mean, they have the spare checker on the six and the spare checker on the five, which maybe can be used to make interboard points, especially the three point. But the mere fact that, you know, those checkers are somewhat out of play, like they'd be, they'd be better off if they were on the 8 and the 7. If they were on the 8 and the 7, now you're starting to talk about being able to make an outside prime, and I would be much more... He was talking uh, about a position where Red would have a much stronger position. Yeah, and I would feel more confident about it not being a double if those pieces were on the outside. The fact that they're... I mean, there's arguments for and against the double. The arguments for the double is, you know, you can use Pratt here and say, like, okay, so large race lead, which isn't necessarily... Wait one second, Steve. Like, Pratt stands for position, race, and threats, which is an approach to determining whether or not you should double or whether or not you should take by examining the program. Go ahead. Right. So the, the pips aspect of the position isn't all that relevant, especially when you're talking about a back game. And in many cases, when you're the more you're down the race, the better off you are, you know, when playing a back game. So that you got you have to be very careful when using Pratt to, you know, apply it appropriately, uh, depending on the types of position you're looking at. Okay, so as far as uh, position is concerned, well, you have uh, four. And a, red has four and a half checkers back, and blue doesn't have any. I mean, I say a half a checker back because, you know, it may he may get hit or he may may not get hit. Um, it's, it's kind of really like five checkers back because for the most part, uh, blue will be able to hit. Not that it'll necessarily elect to hit as we talked about the six four and the six five won't hit. Uh, but, but red, red is going to have four or five checkers back behind a prime with a not too unreasonable chance of it being a five prime, whether that it's the 10 point or the nine point that's made. Uh, blue may roll something relatively weak, you know, such as a uh, five one. And be able to hit, and you know, depending on how he plays, and maybe he plays 15, 10, 6, 5, or 15, 10, 15, uh, 14, 13. But in any case, uh, red may not be able to hit back, in which case, um, blue can extend that prime, you know, make another blocking point. So now when you're talking about five checkers behind a four or five prime, I think, I mean, the only thing that, main thing that, that says I don't want to double here is the fact that. Red has blue outboarded. I mean, all the other aspects of the game, uh, I mean, you know, now we want to go back to uh, talk about market losers. So um, it's a little bit difficult. Um, I mean, the easy way to look at it is to say, okay, well, if I have nine market losers, then I should double. That's so Hagen's law. Is that nine? Is that correct? Yes. Nine, okay. nine net market losers. Nine net market losers. Okay. But... The question when you talk about market losers is not only the amount of numbers that lose the market, but what magnitude they lose the market by. So if you have, you know, you know, nine or ten market losers, you know, net market losers, 
but they only barely lose the market, then on the rest of your numbers, you're very sorry you doubled. But maybe in this case, um, well, so uh, what I what I like to do when I'm going through a position is to go through the numbers and, uh, you know, depending on the situation, if it's a chouette, you want to irritate people and take too much time, and if you're playing in a tournament match, then uh, you have the clock considerations, so you need to, you know, play fairly quickly. Well, if you're, um, a chouette, if you're a my chouette, you already took too much time, but I don't want you to do it as if you were in a chouette. I want to do it right, so we're working okay. kind of Okay, so I would go through the numbers, and the method that I use, and it's any method is fine, I just go start with the smallest numbers and go through the largest numbers. And I do it fairly quickly, and I'll just, like, you know, and I'll just try and think to myself, which one of these might be a market loser? So double ones, no, two one, no, three one, no, four one, no, five one, no, six one, no, double twos, nah, because then even if you make the nine point, you're leaving, you know, three blocks in jeopardy. Uh, three two no, four two no, five two no, six two definitely not. Uh, double threes. I don't know. I mean, you can make the ten point and the three point, and then it's starting to look like it's not a double because double threes is a pretty strong roll. And even then, you know, red's got the timing of the two pieces on the midpoint. You know, four three makes the ten point, but you know, it's not over. You know, five three makes the ten point. Six three is not a market loser. Double fours, well, you can, it's a pretty strong roll. Uh, no, I think this is not a double, actually, because even double fours is one of the very strongest rolls, which makes the nine point and hits. And, you know, red may come to the edge of the prime, and red's still got the timing of the two piece on the midpoint, so I'm pretty sure that I would say no double here. No double take. It, 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 okay. What I noticed was all the rolls that hit red's loose checker, you're assuming that even after the hit, red's still got to take. And those aren't market losers. And part of uh, part of the skill in in, uh, in determining what is a market loser is being able to picture whether or not the opponent has a take or not on the next roll. And again, for people who may be beginners watching this, a market loser means that if you roll something on your next roll, and then after his next roll he would pass, then you've lost your market. You've lost your chance for him to take the cube, and that's a major reason that you might double. Now, to get a little bit clearer, the way we teach at the Backgammon Learning Center to approach every cube is to first ask yourself, is the opponent going to take or not? We use Woolsey's Law because that simplifies the process. So, uh, in Steve's mind, I'm sure he does this. If he had thought that, that, if he had doubted at all that Red had a take, he wouldn't have bothered even counting market losers. Am I correct, Steve? Yeah, not only that, you know, you can, you can get a sense you know, as to how your opponent feels about the position based on their words that they say or their body language, which is kind of getting into, the, like, the poker aspect of things. And there is that element in backgammon, too. It's, you know, it's the human element. Uh, but, yeah. So, again, you, you made a very, very quick assumption, though you didn't verbalize it, that Red's taking. But you all, we always start there. And if you're really a analyzing a position, once you assume red's taking, and Steve also assumed that even if you hit the, the loose checker of reds, he's taking on the next roll. So uh, if he's if he thought that blue might that red might pass or that it is a pass, then according to Woolsey's law, you would go ahead and double because even if it's close and you're not sure if he has a take or not, it's a great time to double because he may not be sure either. And that's the that's the methodology. Steve jumped that because he instantly knew that this is a take. And he just wasn't sure about the double, so he uh, he went into that uh, area. The truth is, he's right. It's a big, big take, and the double is right on the border. So I, whether you double or not, uh, I think it's uh, uh, plus plus. I think it's real, real close. Um, let's see. I think it's at point one zero or something like that. So uh, you're you're. I'm going to give you a correct answer on this. Clearly, you can almost flip a coin. And in truth, when it's this close with an XG analysis, you really have to roll it out to get the right answer. And I did roll it out, and it's still a double by .012. So uh, anytime you're within 1%, I have another rule of thumb that I apply. Uh, if, you are, if, you, if you are Steve or me in a chouette or in a money game, here it is .10, which means you can almost flip the coin it's, it, as far as whether you double or not monster take. 
But when you find any position where you think it's real, real close to whether or not you should double or not, that's when you look at other features. How hard is the position to play for you or your opponent? Who are you playing? Is this a guy? I know I have some people in my chouette that would drop this in a second if it was towards the end of the day and they were plus on the sheet. And I have other guys that would uh, take any cube almost till the very end if they're stuck on the sheet and it's towards the end of the day. So you start playing other factors. And, of course, in a match, you start looking at the score. But Steve certainly gets this right by, he said no double, but who cares when you're point one zero? As a matter of fact, when we make bets, if a bet is within point zero two, we call it a tie. So this is a tie. And you got the take part right. Uh, however, in the Chouette, this was passed. Uh, somebody thought this was a pass. And what they said, and I sort of agree with some of what they said, uh, a 1-4 back game is not much of a game. And this is, almost really isn't a back game because it's not timed very, very well for a back game. And this may end up being a one-point holding game or a four-point holding game. It isn't a very pretty game to play. But with all that, it's still a big, big take. There's still enough game here for, for Red to take, and, and the, the, the gamins aren't that high to where the numbers work. Anything else to add here, Steve? Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't even consider this a back game at this point because Red has blue outboarded. You know, you just have to look at things in terms of what's going to happen next. The uh -huh. blue's going to, you know, hit and attempt to make the point. But, if you know, if they're only successful in part of that equation, you know, Red may hit a fly shot and then pick up another block. So you're very far from being primed in and playing a back game. So that, that was my hesitancy to double right there. Gotcha. Very good. You're right on. Let's move on. We have six more. Let's go a little faster if we can. Okay. I don't, I, we lose people's attention after an hour, I found on these videos. Okay. Uh, everybody wants instant uh, uh, gratification, including me. Here's a checker play problem. And I had, I, I'll tell you the truth, I had the 6 1 to play here and wasn't sure what to do. I'm holding a two cube. It's what we certainly call a prime versus prime play. And obviously, my question is with my 6 1, do I hit or not? Uh, it's really that simple. Steve, what do you think and why? Okay, so you would want to look at how the numbers play, whether you hit or don't hit. If you're not going to hit, you're going to play 9-3 uh, to three and 5-4, uh, to four, in which case uh, blue has, uh, let's see, they have, well, they have 7, they have 9 spare pips to play before they even have to break their prime, and the average number that doesn't contain a six is a seven. I've, I've actually figured this out here. Uh, I'm not absolutely certain of that, but I'm pretty sure. So their average roll isn't even, isn't even going to break the prime. So my play would be to hit because more than likely blue's going to have a free shake and not even have to break. Uh, and even if they are forced to attack, you know, red will be an underdog to hit them back, in which case, you know, blue will have many, many extra rolls if they close the board to be able to get out. If you hit, um, and if you were to hit here, it would be very bad if, uh, I mean, red, red obviously wants blue to come in. It would be very bad if, uh, you know, blue just didn't come in, red would bust. But red can gain when blue comes in with an ace. Uh, then red will probably become some kind of small favorite. Um, and their sixes will still play bad, but they can possibly roll something small and maintain a six prime. Depending on what, what red rolls, red can roll ace six, ace five, ace four, and uh, or even possibly ace three, and then maybe red can, you know, that would be blue, and then red can roll something small, and then when blue cracks the prime, then we're starting to talk about red being able to redouble. Okay. Also, uh, another added benefit for for hitting loose is that if blue gets back, uh, there's a couple of good things that can happen. First of all, red can anchor up, in which case they'll have long-term equity in holding an ace point game. And also, if uh, red doesn't come in, you know, while blue will have plenty of tempo and ability and time to get out of there, they may not. I mean, they roll, they roll you know, a 5-4 or something like that. And then uh, so this, you know, by getting hit, it stops red from, from moving forward, which is one of the negative aspects of this position. One thing I might add is that I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I had remember hearing that in this particular position, it takes an average of four rolls for blue to get out, to roll a one and then a six. Does that sound about right to you? Um, I remember reading something in a Danny Kleinman book many, many years ago, and I think it was more than four, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, he, you know, he's a mathematician and all that, so 
Uh, that would probably be maybe Asgard Benjamin. He might he might have a good idea. You yeah, know, that's uh, another. That's another reason uh, why uh, I hit uh, as well. And uh, we have just proven that we're being honest because, and we're also proving that Steve's as bad a player as I am sometimes because hitting is the wrong play here. Uh, not a huge amount. Let me plus plus it. Again, I always uh, highlight and do plus plus an XG because it's the highest analysis you can get without a rollout. Uh, but it's really wrong to hit here. So uh, this baffled me as well. And that's part of a look. It turns out to be a blunder in plus plus to hit. So let's well, look. At, I mean, let's look at yeah. the not hitting play and see why that works better. Well, I mean, all of the numbers that don't escape. Uh, you know, those medium-sized numbers. 4-3 is, like, tolerable, but you can roll 5-3, five, 5-4, three, five, and even though double fives does put your opponent on the bar, but double five, double four, double three, you know, has, you got some timing issues. And if Red does roll a 4-3 or a 5-2, then, and he hits loose and he gets hit back, then, uh, I mean, sorry, Blue hits loose, and then, and then uh, if Red stays out, then, um, Blue may bust, and if red does come in and hit, blue may come in and, and then crack. So, so why, did you, why did you get this wrong now that you know that you can say all these things? Why did you get it wrong over the board? Well, because I was just looking at, at a two-way game in that if they actually, and that was probably slight in error because there are actually three possibilities. Uh, if you hit loose uh, and now red, uh, blue fails to enter, that's a disaster. So uh, now, I mean, it's true red can roll something really small and make a six prime, but even even if red, let's just say, rolled like, you know, a three one of his next shake and made a six prime, and then even blue came in with a one six, red still got to move. And more than likely, blue's not going to come in. So failing to enter here for blue is a big disadvantage for red. Uh, okay. And also... If I might, Steve, let me tell you why I think you got it wrong. You did a great okay. job of going through all of the situation and roles of what happens if you hit and red comes in, but you you didn't spend enough time going through all the roles when he doesn't come in and all the roles that are plus and minus with the other play. You really have to go through all of the, all four, the good and bad of each of the of the roles, and that takes a lot of time. Now XG can yeah. help us with that, and I'm going to show you a trick. You highlight the two plays we're thinking about. Of course, there's a play in the middle that we're not going to look at because it's kind of silly. If you're going to not hit, there's no question that Steve's play of keeping your checkers spread out is better. So we're going to ignore the second roll. We're going to look at the hit versus non-hit. You highlight those, you right-click, and then you look at dice distribution. And Extreme Gammon does for you what would take us a lot more time over the board. And again, I think the reason Steve missed it is because if you had, if I gave you an hour to get this right, and you went through all of the rolls after both plays, whether he comes in or not, I'm sure you would have gotten it right because there's, there's a significant difference when you look at how many bad rolls there are for you and how many good rolls there are for you and compare the two plays. And I think this is the, the, the dice distribution for the non-hitting play, uh, and you have some real huge upside rolls when he rolls a 5-4 uh, when you don't hit. Steve mentioned double four, double five. Steve quickly saw the, right, the rolls that really help you when you don't hit. And when you do hit, there's you don't see any green going up to the top. You don't see a whole bunch of good rolls that really, really help you. So I think that's that's what has to be done over the board, and that's why both you and I got this wrong. Anything further to add on this one, Steve? Yeah, something that I like to do. When I get a position, I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So I'll go back to the initial position there, and I'll make, like, an alternative position. So I'll change, you know, I'll, I'll maintain one of the, sides as the dependent variable, like it just stays the same, and I'll change, what, like, so I'll keep red the same, and I'll just start moving that, that checker on the eight point forward or backwards. Uh, you know, well, I, so, if you give blue more time, I think you have to hit, right? Like this. Uh, yeah, because... Uh, Let's, try that. That. Let's just try that. And I'm right. And Steve had the same idea. If blue has more time than he had, then not hitting isn't going to make him crash enough to where it's a benefit. And now we have to take the chance of getting hit and dancing uh, is more of an upside for us than when blue has less time. So I agree with what you're doing. This variation is telling us 
that it's all about Blue's timing is going to be the major swing between the two plays. Right, and so what I really like to do is, uh, so put the checker on the three-point for the moment. That's fair checker. And I like to, so, so if moving the checker back to the seven-point made it clearly right to hit, and this play makes it clearly right not to hit, I like to find that exact break-even point where, like, it probably should be on the five or the six-point, where uh, then you're not sure. It, you know, it's like your reference position. So here it's a point oh four. So Phil's going to try it on the five-point and see. Um, nope. It's going to be, looks like it's big either way. Maybe you're right. We have to move the one on the eight point a pip or two to get that, to get that tipping point. We're getting pretty okay. close to it. Getting anyway, so close. this is something you can do on your own. We don't have to finish, you know, going over to finding the exact, but just the, the idea of manipulating a, a position by just moving one checker. Uh, and if you start moving, moving too many checkers around, it gets confusing. So just find one checker that you think is critical. In this case, it would be like a, a timing checker for blue to move it forward or backward and to see like where you get your break-even point and then try and recall that. And that would be your, your baseline reference position to, to moving forward to understanding the position. Right. This, this illustrates, this is that we, we got pretty close to the tipping point right here. But what this does is by we made a two-pip difference to move this checker from here to here and we changed it from a blunder to a, to a wash, just about a wash, whether you hit or not. Now, that's a good argument for what, uh, in fact, Paul McGrill had said to me and several others that, uh, in, in fact, Kit was the one who really pushed it. The, a, a blunder on a, on a cube error is really not that big a blunder mentally because uh, here only a two-pip movement of this checker turns a play into a blunder. So uh, the way we do our PRs is by the equity that's lost, but if somebody makes a big blunder error compared to a checker play error, they're really not making that big a mistake. So I wouldn't count this as that big a mistake for either me or Steve. But you lost, and we're going to go on to the next one. You're two and one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Number four. Uh, we have another checker play. Nope, I'm sorry. We have a cube uh, decision. Blue is on roll. Cube action. All right. Well, um, I'd like to start with, Steve, do you think red has a take or not, and then go from there? I would definitely think red has a take. I mean, red's got good structure. He's got uh, the top three points in his board. Blue's got a piece out of play. I mean, Blue, you know, I, I, as you just asked me about the take aspect. Um, so he blow, blue, Red does not have any additional blots in jeopardy. Um, his builder on the 11th, the spare builder on the 11th point isn't ideally placed. You'd probably rather have it on the uh, 8 or on the, you know, 6 or 5. But it's not terrible. Um, so I definitely would take here. I mean, you are down 33 pips. You are outboarded uh, 4 to 3. But... You know, because blue has the deep, three deepest points made and a piece out of play, you just it seems like you easily have enough counterplay to take the game here. Okay. What about the cube? <clears throat> um, well, forgetting about bluff value for the moment, you know, so do I think this is actually a double? Well, I mean, you know, the aspects that I just talked about were that uh, blue's got a 33-pip lead. He's ahead... Uh, He's got he's has a uh, red out boarded four to three. He does have some jokers. Um, he doesn't have that many bad numbers, as you'll notice. Um, and this is something that you can do in any game. Is uh, as you're looking at how the numbers play, when you see a number that plays bad on one side of the board, if it also plays good on the other side of the board, then that's a benefit. So double force is blocked for blue, and that's kind of like unfortunate. But double force can make the five points. And so the, the other doubles, double two, double three, double five, are perfectly fine. You can, you can start to escape your back checkers. Uh, you have our other independent numbers like, you know, five two and five three and three, you know, three two makes the inside point. You do have some bad numbers as, as blue. I mean, your double six is probably the worst roll. Um, six four is no bargain, but, uh, you want to start thinking about at what point in time would you lose your lose market. Let's just say red rolls, I mean, blue rolls a 4-3 and swings the checker from the 18 point to the 11, uh, the 11 point. And if uh, red failed to enter there, it would seem like it's a huge pass at that point. So because of volatility, I'm thinking you have to double here. I think it's a double and a take. Okay. Uh, 
Can we hit the button? Wish I had a drum roll. You're absolutely right about the take, by the way. It's an easy take. And usually when it's an easy take, that's a, a big flag for me not to double. Uh, but that's not always right, of course. There are easy takes that are clear, clear doubles as well. But this is not a double by a lot. And oh. over the board, this was doubled and taken. And uh, very awkward for blue. And I think red won the game. But that's hindsight. But the fact is, it's far from a double. And uh, John O'Hagan, I think, is our, our hero on this one. I don't think you can find nine net market losers. In fact, you can find some rolls that, like a double four, which would be great. Certainly, that would be a market loser if red didn't come in. But when you take all the rest of the rolls that aren't that good for blue, and you have red come in, and maybe even come in hitting, uh, those you have to be subtracted from the market losers. Those are what we call anti-market losers. And there's enough of those to stop it from being a cube. Let's look at dice distribution and get a real uh, look at, uh, at the rolls. And by the way, Stick always told me, I really shouldn't use dice distribution without hitting four ply to get it, because uh, it starts out at one ply, which isn't that good. But you can see that uh, that the upcoming rolls of blue, he only has a few, only one, double five, double three. Uh, he has some, oh yeah, four ply made it much better. He has a lot of rolls that make him pretty good, but he's got plenty of rolls that are not so good where his equity is not good at all. Uh, and not that many that are going to lose your market. And even these rolls that are very good, like uh, uh, double five and double three and double four and so on, that's assuming uh, they're good and, and, and red still has some chance to come in and hit or come in and escape or something else too. So anything to add to this, Steve? Yeah, I actually, since I have, I am biased and I can see the answer is that it's a huge no double, I'm willing to go out on a limb and say that if blue rolls, double fours, and red fans, it's still a take. We'll see if that's crazy or not. Okay, you're willing to go out on a limb and say what? That if blue rolls double fours, it makes the five point, and red stays out, I think it's a take. Wow. Let's find out. I would... That's a huge equity jump that you got. You have to, you know, yeah. go from a point two three to yeah. a drop. I'm, I'm passing this like a rock, so you're, I mean, let's find out. That's, that's the hell of a, that, that proves the market loser theory, too, though. I think if you pass, I think if you dance, you're, you're passing, but I am anyway. It is a pass, big pass. Oh, wait a minute. I thought, well, they, you, you were four away, I was two away. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Well, you, at least you don't do what some of the other guys do. They say, okay, wait a minute, roll it out. And then they, that no, way we, no, 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 At least they One point one eight six is convincing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. it, let's do one more thing with this position. Let's take that uh, dead checker on the deuce point and just put it on the six point, see if that makes a difference. Well, that's got to be much better for blue, of course. It certainly is. is it, you think it's going to make it a double? No. I do. I, don't think it, I can't believe it's that big a difference. Yeah, it was a minus .146 or something. I think it's going to turn it into a double. Let me be right once. Oh, you're barely right. You are right. No, let's, don't roll it out. Don't roll it out. Okay. <laughs> okay, I got one right. Fantastic. Okay. These kind of goofy positions are tough, but, again, you know, I read a very good quote recently. You don't learn by experience, really. You learn by your mistakes. So every time that uh, we, we make a mistake, it's an, uh, you look at it not as an embarrassment, and uh, uh, we look at it as an opportunity to grow. And I think one of the things that I really like about Steve and, and several of my other teachers that I do this with, I do this with John O'Hagan and Stick and Perry and others, they're not afraid to be wrong. And when we're giving lessons uh, and we're talking to our students, we, that's why we're using XG. Uh, and we will be wrong also. We're not perfect. In fact, Mochi right now has the best, is the best player in the world, and he's wrong plenty of times too, and he's not afraid to show when he's wrong. He does live uh, exhibitions all the time. So this is a hard game. We're not going to get it right all the time. But if we learn from our mistakes, and if you do what Steve just did and make a variation, this is how you'll remember it better because you'll start seeing the, how the features of the position make it more right. But Steve and I combined probably have close to 100 years of backgammon playing experience. I think I played for 55 years. What are you up to, what are you up to Steve? 
Well, actually, I was just thinking about it the other day. I was actually watching uh, the 60 Minutes piece on uh, Backgammon with the interview with Paul McGrill uh, from 1978, from 40 years ago. Huh? And uh, that was a fantastic, if anybody gets a chance to see that, um, I think the USPGF is putting it out somewhere. But uh, I actually was thinking that I had played my first tournament prior to that interview. I, it was the summer of 1976, so I have played tournament backgammon for going on 42 years. Hard to believe, but it's true. So between us, we got over 90 years of experience, and you're seeing us make all kinds of mistakes. And we're not just casual players. Both of us have spent many, many hours studying the game, and I've, I can't tell you how much time and effort I've put in studying, studying and, and taking lessons as well as giving them. So uh, this is not an easy game. That's what we love about backgammon. And these positions, you know, we, you think you've seen them all. Every single day I see positions that I, I don't think I've ever seen before. Maybe it's a matter of my memory, but I really don't. I really know we've come up with new positions all the time. All right, let's move on a little quicker, Steve. Oh, we got, we got uh, four more. Okay, money game. Red's holding a two cube and has a double five to play. And again, I'm willing to admit that I blew this play. What would you do, Steve? Let's make it easy. The first thing you do is come in with one five, and now you've got three more. I always do the forced part first. Well, we own the cube here, and, uh, wow, interesting. I mean, the safest play that you can make is you can play bar 20, uh, 13 to 8, and then safety 21 to 10, but... The problem with that move is is that you don't have – no, that checker would go to the 10-point. I mean, I'm sorry, I apologize, the 11-point. If I said 10, I meant 11. 11. Okay, so the problem with this play is is that you're still pretty far down in the race. You're outboarded 4 to 3. You do own the cube, and to some extent his aces and deuces are duplicated. But, you know, you're still allowing the tempo in his favor, so – I guess I'm going to go back to the original position and think about this for a second. It's going to be between hitting loose and switching. So if you came in bar 20, 13, and hit loose, then that's a play that duplicates aces. It gives uh, blue nine bad numbers. Uh, even some of the incoming numbers aren't all that great, two, six. Uh, three, um, yes, several in, you know, incoming bad numbers. Uh, and the only other play that I'm considering is the switch play. Um, so let's take a moment and uh, let's go back. Okay, so enter and then 13, 8, and then switch uh, 6 to 1 twice. Let me take a look, look at that for a second. So this play, there is a reasonable amount of duplication on twos and threes. Uh, you've really kind of chopped your position up, though. If blue does come in, it's like kind of, you know, you're really hoping that he stays out, and it's only a three-point board. So I'm just going to hit loose. I'm just going to play bar 20, 13, 8, and, and uh, 11 to 1 hitting. Okay. No, by the way, what I did at the beginning of the position is I hit Control-C to copy the position to my clipboard. And then any time I want to go back to the original, I hit Control-V. That's a good trick in, in XG. So here's our original position, and Steve got this right. But I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, I made the switch play, which is really, really bad. Uh, it's a blunder, and uh, let me plus plus it. But it's really fun. I'm glad that Steve even considered the play because the guys in the Chouette couldn't stop laughing at how horrible a play I had made and how ridiculous it was, but at least... Steve actually considered it a little bit, and it's not quite a blunder. It's, it's just a bad play. But let me tell you what happened. It's really cute. First of all, he entered, uh, my opponent entered on the three-point, and I don't remember what else he had with the three. But then I rolled double fours, and I made the three-point. So I had a four-point board with the open six-point, and the rest of the game continued for quite a while, and he, uh, my opponent ended up with the six-point holding game, which is we weren't able to find that in any book, <laughs> how you play a six-point holding game. <laughs> yeah. Nobody was quite sure what to do. 
because we none of us had a reference from then on. And I thought, gee, I'm going to do this from now on because at least my opponents won't know how to play a six-point holding game. And most of us don't know how to play the game with an open six-point. But uh, I lost the game. It turned out to be a bad play. Uh, but let's give Steve credit. He got it right. Uh, I think if we did have one more point in the inner board, I think you would agree with me, Steve, then that switching play would make a lot of sense. Yeah, especially when you can just pick up those extra blocks out on the outfield. That would be kind of a fun thing to do. Yeah, it would be. Let's, let's just do that and just see if we're right. Let's put one more point here and see if the switch play works. No, <laughs> it still doesn't. Still doesn't. I guess because you're going to recube uh, too often. Maybe anyway, for all those for all those people that laughed at you, do they realize how hard it is to get a silver medal? <laughs> That's right. I came yeah. in second. That's exactly okay. right. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Fun position, and uh, I'm not embarrassed to say I blew it. Uh, but at least I can say I wasn't so horribly ridiculous. Okay, here we go again with doubles. By the way, I always say when you roll doubles, look for a great play, then find a better one, because that's what happens with doubles. See, there, you, often you instantly see a really great play, and you make it, and you pick up the dice, and you think, oh, my God, there was a better play, because there's just so many ways to play doubles. So here I read to play double four. But, well, this is the position I was telling you about, where I made the, oh. the three-point. You already know what I did. I made the three-point. Is it right? What would you do? Well, we have a little bit of quiz factor going on here because you told me you made the play. That I don't know. Does that mean you made the wrong play or the right play? Well, let's look at the alternatives here. Uh, well, definitely three-point is a strong candidate play. You're making a four-point board. Uh, your, your opponent still has uh, one, you'll have one on the bar, two extra checkers in jeopardy, uh, and you're maintaining the anchor. So a lot of good aspects of the position. Another possible play is to hit um, 20 to 12 and then 11 to 3. And I really don't like that play because you're giving up a lot of, of the good elements of the, of, of the, the game that uh, Phil achieved with his move. You're giving up the anchor. You have, you have one, two, three, four, five, six checkers in jeopardy. You're not making an additional point in the board. Uh, of course, you know, the upside is if it works, um, you're in a very strong attacking position. Um, and I suppose to some extent, if you do get hit back, you're favored to anchor, but that's a lot of, uh, that's a, those are, that's a lot of blocks to, to really, uh, but you agree, with, you agree with me that if you don't get hit back or if he dances or doesn't make the six point, you're probably too good to double. Yeah. If he, if he doesn't come in at all, for sure, you're too good. If he comes in just with like a two, one. Um, you have enough good numbers. I personally would continue to play. Uh, if he, obviously, if he anchors up, then it's not even in question anymore. If you get hit, forget about that. Any beginners watching, by too good we mean that Red would not redouble because he is likely to win too many gammons compared to the games he might lose. So you play on and try and win a gammon here instead of just doubling, bring your opponent drop, bring you two points. Yeah, so uh, you don't I think I'm just going to play. You don't like this play, huh? I think I'm just going to make your play. I'm not brave enough to make you know, this crazy double hit play. And okay. did I miss something else? Is there another? It doesn't seem like there's another alternative available. Uh, okay. Well, they laughed like crazy at me when I made the three point, but I said, "Look, I got to be consistent. If I'm going to be an idiot on the on the last play, I want to be an idiot on this play too." And it is the wrong play. And you are missing a play. Uh, let's see. Oh, you can make the nine point. You can play twenty one nine, and then come off the anchor. It does. Hmm. Oh, too simple. <laughs> too simple. Well, to sixes play. and threes are duplicated. Uh, uh. No, I I didn't see this one. Yeah, let me show you the the final of how it looks. And by the way, our play is not horrible. It's .055, and, and obviously if we roll it out, I'm sure it'll be uh, much better than that and maybe even be right, right? We'll just say that, just for saving face. But here's what the right play looks like. And again, uh, you don't get hit that often. You, uh, I won't count all the ways, but uh, uh, with Bob Urquhart, I developed a shortcut method of determining how often you get hit back here from the bar. 
that's another lesson we'll do another time. But we didn't miss the play by much. But can you tell us why this play is better than making the three-point? Well, um, you're escaping a couple of back checkers. Um, the race is relatively close. There's certainly the duplication element is the first thing I'm looking at. Sixes and threes, entrance, sixes and threes, hit. Uh, even if blue comes in off the bar and hits, he's not, you know, he's a big favorite to anchor up again because he'll immediately have fives and fours to come in. And if not, blue's counterattack is somewhat limited at that point because he has a piece out of play and just a couple of builders to attack with. So you're probably not even getting closed out if you get hit back. And that's if you get hit back. And you're probably, uh, it's probably only, it's like, like right around half the numbers will hit back. Maybe, maybe a little less. Uh-huh. Well, uh, remember, okay, well. 25% of the time, and everybody should know this, 25% of the time blue will dance, won't come in at all. With three points made, uh, and the, here's the trick, three times three is nine. So there are nine rolls where blue won't come in. And that's a, that's a pretty big number. That's a huge advantage you gain at that point. And uh, at that point, red's got a very strong position compared to where yeah, it well. I, yeah, I, I just counted the numbers, and if I'm correct, it's only nine nine counter hits for uh -huh. blue. So, yeah, this uh, I don't know, but I mean, making, making you know, making the three point, and maintaining the anchor. I guess, I guess when 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 you're not hit back and you're only getting hit back 25 percent of the time, you got a very strong attacking position here. Your your nine is is off because you're forgetting about the balls that hit this checker on the other side too. Okay. Although the three is duplicated, but it does give you now twos that also hit. He would certainly hit with a with a double two, or a three two, or a, or a six two. So you got to add those numbers as well. All right, let's go on to the next one. Number seven. We got two more. I'm learning a lot. I hope everybody watching is, and if nothing else, you're learning that it's a fun game, which is the number one lesson I want to give people. It's a great game to play. All right, blue on roll, cube action. Again, you start out with does red take or pass, and then go from there. I would take, and I would double. Okay. So why am I? You want which one do you want to hear first? Why I'm taking or why I'm doubling? Uh, let's see what the answer is, and then you can explain both. Well, okay. I, I, I think I understand the take very easily because you're anchored. You're not going to get gammed that much with the anchor. And Blue's still got the checker back, and he's got the horrible ace point made. The double was really my question, but it looks like it's a bigger double than it is the take. So what's your what's your take on this? Well, <laughs> good pun. Uh, well, for starters, I would double just because you got, you got a massive race lead. Uh, you have four builders to make uh, make the five point, and if you do make the five point, now that's going to severely limit Red's ability to make some kind of backing. Not won't make it impossible. Let me interrupt for one second. When you have four builders to make a point, there's another trick. Four times four is sixteen. That means if all doubles plays, there are sixteen rolls that will make the five point. Since double six doesn't work. That means there's 15 numbers. So very quickly, we know there's 15 numbers that make the five point. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I was actually was just given a lesson the other day, and we spent a reasonable amount of time on this concept. And I said, uh, I said to my student, I said, there's this three steps in what you want to look at. You want to look at you want you want to take the number of builders and square it, and then that's the number out of 36 that'll make the point. The second thing that you want to do is you want to look at the doubles that don't make the point. You know, so double one, double two, double three will, but double six won't. And the third step is you want to add in doubles that are from a different part of the board that will make the point. Double four, I missed it. You're right. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's a three-step process. You right. square the builders, you subtract the non-working doubles, you add the working doubles from another part of the board. So in this case, it's, it's you know, it's your standard 16. So with 16 pointing numbers and a, you know, and a massive race lead, I'm going to double this. The, the take seems pretty easy because you've got a high anchor and blue's got the race point made. And, you know, even though red's got, does not have an active builder on the, uh, the eight point, we're pretty far from that being relevant. So, uh, you know, that might, my, my, my take on the position was, was that it was a double and a take. 
Okay, and uh, over the board this was passed, and that's another reason to double. And I, I know that Joe Sylvester uh, lived with me for nine months, and he used to always hammer home to me, whenever you're in any doubt at all, you're better off giving the cube than not, because you can't get a mistake out of your opponent unless you give the cube. Now, of course, there's a downside to that, because I've also been told that a big gift, uh, one of the biggest gifts you can give your opponent is, a, is an early cube. So if you have an opponent that you're sure is taking, that there's no way in hell he's passing, that's, that's another reason to hang on to the cube. But you will get some passes in this position, and we did. Uh, by the way, in addition to the 16 numbers that hit, when you have four builders, that means you have 32 numbers that, that hit, that, that, that don't necessarily point, plus indirects, like the double four. So if you don't point on the five, you're going to hit loose almost every time you can. I, would, I can't imagine any roll that hits that where you wouldn't to put a second checker on the bar because you don't want him to make the five point. And there's another feature that's very important to remember in positions like this. Blue has made his ace point. That's a horrible thing to happen to Blue unless he plays a hitting game in a blitzing game. That's the, that's the game plan for Blue now. It's not just playing meekly and mildly, and, uh, it, and you certainly don't want to play a priming game. So your game plan is a hitting game. You're going to hit that checker, and that scared the hell out of him. Yes. All right. Good, good work, Steve. One more. All right. <laughs> and again, we have a cube action problem. The cube is in the center. Red is on row. Again, the first question is, does blue have a take? And then, should red double? <laughs> well, uh, blue definitely has a take. Um, I mean, initially, I look at the position... Blue's got the anchor. Red's got three pieces out of play. Uh, he does have some good numbers working for him. I mean, fives don't work on the defense, you know, on the other side of the board, but they work on the offensive side of the board. So, but I mean, five three to some extent is duplicated. I mean, you will make the three point if you roll five three, but that would have been an escaping number. Uh, blue has, I mean, red has some horrendous numbers like double fours and five four are awful. Um, I mean, in my personal opinion, you know, just a quick answer is is that, uh, well, maybe I don't want to give a quick answer because, I mean, you are, you are way, way, way ahead in the race. You do have gamut chances. There's, you know, four and a half checkers back to one back. It, it sort of seems like it might not be a double just based on, you know, how crummy Red's position is, but you know, do we have enough good numbers? I mean, you got double ones, three, one, five, three. Double fives is terrible. Um, and now the question is, how much are we losing on market buy? I mean, if you roll double aces or three one and blue doesn't come in, it's a big market loss. But if you rolled like a five three and then red blue came in with a deuce, you probably you still wouldn't have a double. So I'm gonna just take a chance and say it's not a double. Let me ask you one question before I show you. You said red has three checkers out of play. I only count two. Uh, this one, and I mean, where's the three checkers that are out of play? Okay, he has three checkers on his ace point, so I'm counting all of those as being out of play. Now, that's maybe a little bit unfair to say that because, you know, the first two checkers are serving some kind of function, but any time you have a point past the anchor, those checkers are out of play with respect to, you know, you know, your ability to be able to prime your opponent in, be able to close them out. So one of them is dead. And the other two are kind of out of play, so I got you. I got yeah. You. Okay. Point the anchor. Take a look at the answer. This was uh, this was passed over the board. Uh, this is this is double pass over the board. Because this you know this looks a little scary to blue. He is afraid of getting gammons. It's not even a double. A yeah, I mean by a tiny bit. Yeah, so, so I guess in practice you want to double this, but, uh, you know, depending on who you're playing, you know, you may not want to not double. If you're fairly, if you're fair, if you're 100% certain they're going to take, then there's no point in doubling here because, I mean, assuming you knew that this was not a double, and that was my suspicion, uh, that it, it was my suspicion that it was not a double. You're, you're right. And, by the way, XG has a nice feature here. This 4.8% means that if you make a mistake in double here uh, and you get people to pass about 5% of the time, that that mistake is more than made up for 
by the fact that you're going to get some wrong passes. And I think you can look at a position like this, and unless you're playing Steve Sachs or a really high-level player, you can assume you probably will get doubles. Five, you will get passes 5% of the time, and that makes it a, a correct double against a human, certainly not a correct double against a superhuman like Steve. Steve, I want to thank you. Uh, you're, you, you are great. Uh, uh, you're a very good sport. I am going to post this, even though you had some uh, clearly wrong answers, because we agreed that's what we're going to do. We're going to be honest. And uh, we'll do this again. And I will, I'm will. i afraid I'm going to miss you in, uh, at Carter's birthday party in April in Vegas. I have a family reunion. But I'm sure I'll see you in Novi and Monte Carlo and many more places. And we'll be working together quite a bit. Steve's got several students and is available to take on some more. And again, he's one of the best teachers in the world, and he was a great teacher before he joined our teaching group. Now he's got all the material that Paul McGrill and Mochi and Perry and Steve and, uh, and Stick and many others have helped us put together. So he's an even better teacher today because of it. And uh, we urge you to contact Steve or me if you're looking for backgammon lessons or go to our website, www.backgammonlearningcenter.com. Steve, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Good morning. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.